Okay, so good afternoon. Uh, welcome everyone to the joint event co-organized by the Center for Judicial Cooperation together with the Migration Policy Center on the occasion of the World Refugee Day. So the purpose of the event is to discuss some of the recent but also older but still persistent challenges faced by asylum governance in Europe, um, such as systemic deficiencies in new asylum legislation, uh, disparities in domestic asylum adjudication, implications of technological advances for international refugee and human rights law, the digital vulnerability of third country nationals, and last but not least, the role of domestic courts in refugee protection. These challenges and potential solution will be discussed by the six speakers of today's event from various disciplinary perspectives, uh, ranging from social, political, legal studies, as well as with practitioners. I would like to mention that the purpose of the event is to have an open platform of discussion and reflection, which is why I strongly encourage the followers of this event to write their questions in the chat section on YouTube. I will do my best to read all the questions at the end of the five uh, presentations. Um, before I introduce the speakers, I would like to first present myself. My name is Madalina Moraru, and I'm a research fellow at the Center for Judicial Cooperation and at the law faculty of the Masaryk University in the Czech Republic, where I carried out research on the role of courts in shaping migration governance and fundamental rights. I'm also responsible for legal training in fields of asylum, immigration, fundamental rights, and rule of law at the Center for Judicial Cooperation. My last book is entitled Law and Judicial Dialogue on the Return of Irregular Migrants from the European Union, and it was published by Hart. Uh, the book shows how courts have uh, shaped the implementation of the return directives and gathers contributions from scholars, judges, lawyers, and policy officers. Like I mentioned in the beginning, this webinar is organized with the occasion of the World Refugee Day. Uh, that we celebrate this Saturday. Um, the political discussion on asylum governance in the last months have concentrated very much on the challenges posed by COVID. However, with the reopening of borders in Europe, the older challenges in European asylum governance are resurfacing, uh, such as the reform of the common European asylum system, which has been uh, in a political stalemate for the last four years. Uh, the current EU asylum instruments have elicited both praises and criticism, um, and to a certain extent we could argue that they have definitely improved fundamental rights protection of asylum uh, seekers compared to earlier EU asylum instruments. Uh, see, for instance, the limitation on asylum detention or on extended right to remain in EU for asylum seekers. However, these improvements have shown uh, to be insufficient for ensuring fair and effective asylum governance. Now, the reasons for the common European asylum system dysfunctionalities, as well as potential way of addressing them will be discussed by our first speaker, uh, Laila Hajabdou, uh, who is uh, a teaching and research fellow at the Migration Policy Center she obtained her uh, PhD in social and political sciences from the UI. And she will present the findings of a very interesting book uh, that she has edited entitled Migration Mobility in the EU. Uh, first of all, Leila, 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 sorry for occasionally butchering your name. <laughs> um, thank you for accepting to co-host this uh, webinar. Um, and I very much look forward to hear your presentation. Uh, Laila, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Mandolina, and good afternoon to everybody. I'm really delighted to take part and to co-host this webinar and also to have these wonderful like, co-presenters and also a very gender equal panel, so, which is also very nice and not so often to see. Um, so, as Madalina already said, I will give like a general overview to start with the webinar about asylum governance. Um, before then, we go into more specific and more detailed aspects and challenges of this asylum governance. So, I would like to share my screen. I hope it's fine and you can see it. Um, so, basically, 
let me see. So I want to take two points. Mainly the first point and the largest point um, will be about the failure of the EU's asylum system or the common European asylum system as it's commonly called. And then I will end on a note on attitudes to asylum. And as Madalina already said, this is based, um, my presentation is based on a book I have co-written with Andrew Geddes, the director of the Migration Policy Center, and my colleague Lisa Brumat here, also a fellow at the MPC. Um, and this is, yeah, and this will be based on our reflections we presented in this book. So let me a little bit uh, look also at the genealogy and how the common European asylum system developed and what were the underlying drivers. And I think one of the main issues um, is really that asylum applications are very uneven across EU member states. And I gave you here two illustrations. So you see like the one is from 2010 and the other one from 2018. The white spots or the white countries colored in white I have below 1,000 asylum applicants, the one in green from uh, 1,000 to 10,000, the one in light blue from 10,000 to 100,000, and the one in dark blue uh, more than 100,000 asylum applicants. And you can really see here very much the clustering and also how it a little bit shifted, but basically the clustering in itself and the distribution stayed the same there is just a, a higher volume also in asylum applications, but you see really very nicely from this picture how uneven um, asylum applicants are distributed across the European Union. So this is at the core of many of the conflicts we have and the challenges we have with asylum governance in the European Union. And when you think of that this is the basis of asylum governance, this very uneven distribution from these perspectives, um, the idea emerged or was established by political elites that asylum seekers are basically policy consumers um, and that they choose countries based on generosity. So this is very much the idea in mind people have or the political elites have um, and the narrative surrounding um, asylum or the field of asylum. I'm not saying this is true or false. I'm just saying that based on this uneven distribution, this is one of the most powerful ideas that floated and upon which also then policy goals um, were developed um, and upon which the common European asylum system also developed. And these policy goals, what we can see is basically to screen out or deter what is perceived or imagined as non-genuine asylum seekers or to prevent asylum shopping so that one asylum applicant goes from one country in the EU to the other uh, according also to the best conditions he or she finds. So then the idea was also the second policy goal to create a level playing field across EU member states so to have very similar conditions or to have the same conditions across the EU in order to prevent or to counter this uneven distribution. So we have to take this in mind, this scenario, to understand also how this policy area developed and what were the underlying drivers. So basically, when you think about this scenario, you could, and that these were the goals which from the very beginning also, um, like drove the, the policy process or the European integration in the field of asylum, you could think that actually what evolved is a very restrictive approach or what some have also called in debates fortress Europe. But actually this would be a too simplified idea um, to dichotomous idea. Actually, no, what we see is a coexistence of restrictive approaches and liberal approaches in this policy field. So it's a kind of ambivalent approach, if you want to say so, which is really oscillating between these two goals or aims between the protection of vulnerable persons of asylum seekers and the defense against uh, so-called abusive claims or what is seen as so-called abusive claims. And when we look at the very beginning when the common European asylum system was established, actually what you saw is that it raised protection standards in some EU member states and in other, it remained, remained at the prior level before European integration. So basically, actually had some advancement in a significant group of countries. But at the same time, we can also see a weakening of protection standards 
through two issues. Namely, the first one is the lack of implementation in states that had weak or no protection systems before European integration. And then the second one is, of course, the externalization of migration and asylum policies to non-European member states, um, but also the externalization to private actors. I mean, the very famous example, of course, are the carrier sanctions, but basically private transport companies like airline companies become border guards, become in charge of state responsibilities. So through these processes of externalization, but also through the lack of implementation, you also saw some weakening in de facto in real life of protection standards. Um, but then you can also ask why um, the European Union has such an ambivalent approach between liberal, having liberal components, having restrictive components, and actually what we explain in the book and trace also in the book that it really has to be understand, understood sorry, as, an as an expression of different institutional interests, of shifting political agendas of national governments, but also of course of priorities of non-state actors, NGOs, human rights actors. So basically what we say and our argument and our emphasis also in the book is that this is a deliberate strategy or what we call deliberate malintegration. So there is different signals for everyone to please everyone, all the actors involved, because you always have competing interests. This is what policy making is about. How do you reconcile this interest or not reconcile, but how do you deal with these competing or contradicting interests? You put these different signals and such an ambivalent fudging approach. So, so good so far. But what has happened is that asylum and migration in general has been more and more politicized, contested, has become much more salient in public debates. Um, and then, of course, even became even more politicized and salient with the 2050 crisis. And this has put this strategy or this ambivalent approach in itself into a crisis. It was something that was not uh, uh, tolerated anymore by the different stakeholders involved. And also what we can see is that the overall consensus in Europe, which so far at least you had a consensus at the official level to grant protections to those in need, now has come under severe pressure. Um, also, so why, why did we see the common European asylum system fail um, in the wake of the 2015 crisis and still like this failure, which we see still ongoing and unraveling? So first, this top-down approach of European integration, um, also in the field of asylum. So when, when this system was established, you had a group of strong states, strong regulators, which created these common European asylum systems and who were imposing this system of weak, on weaker regulators, which were then uh, de facto unable to build this necessary structure. So at the very beginning, you had this implementation problem on the way how European integration goes, namely top down, and, it, and you had these power asymmetries between these strong states who already had the system in place and those who hadn't. And then here the, the dilemma comes in by establishing these common systems, actually the responsibility for asylum in these countries who had weaker capacities actually increased. So this is the, one of the main dilemmas or one of the root causes of the failure of the common European asylum system. But then again, also with the Dublin regulation in space, so Dublin, most of, of you will know, of course, Dublin regulation is the responsibility of the country for the first place of entry, that this is actually also, as many researchers have observed, like stimulating solidarity or responsibility averse behavior. And then, of course, last but not least, you have really competing visions among member states. First, you have these very traditional um, asylum receiving states, which were very much pro EU cooperation, pro EU integration, pro solidarity, simply as a way to adjust these imbalances to make asylum applications less uneven because they were the main recipients. Then you had these new member states who were basically not receiving any asylum seekers at all or hardly any. Um, they were um, contra solidarity and against EU cooperation because for them there was no need or even contesting EU cooperation. And then you had a third group, namely the states at the Mediterranean border, the southern European states, 
were pro-solidarity because they were affected or they are affected by asylum applications. But at the same time, they see different standards between member states as a safety valve to reduce asylum numbers. So to, to, to manage these increasing numbers. So there you have a middle, middle position. Um, I want to end with the last slide, my reflections and namely about attitudes to asylum because when you follow all the debates you know, about asylum and this in, uh, decrease in consensus to grant protection um, to um, refugees, you would actually think everybody is against asylum seekers. It's very much contested, but actually that's a misguided belief because when you look at the data, uh, at the data, at studies, you actually see that the EU citizens do support distribution mechanisms also inside the European Union relative to countries' capacities and not according to first place of entry, like foreseen by the Dublin regulation. And they do so even if this means more asylum seekers for their country. So it's a very justice-oriented solidarity or like equality-oriented approach. And also data like from the Eurobarometer clearly shows that people are in favor of more European integration in the field of asylum. A recent study done by the Migr Migration Policy Center by my colleagues here, the MPC Deputy Director Martin Roos, actually also came to similar conclusions, namely that citizens are in favor of protection, in favor of protecting refugees, but they attach some conditions to it. For instance, like limitations, some limitations on family reunification. So the interesting question here is to ask how to reconcile these public attitudes with international law, which does not foresee any conditions on refugee protection and how more generally or more broadly, how do you reconcile different interests among different actors in a politicized setting as we have today, as such like, like deliberate malintegration or like these ambivalent approaches are also not feasible anymore. I would like to end here and thanks very much for your attention. And if you want to know more, there is more in the book and yeah. And I'm looking forward also now to the other contributions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Laila, for your inspiring presentation. I think you already gave us much food for thought. Um, and uh, if you have any questions for Lila, please type them uh, in the chat section on YouTube, uh, and I'll do my best to read them at the end of the presentations. Um, so after Lila's uh, political science perspective on asylum governance, we pass to a social anthropological perspective on asylum adjudication in Europe. Uh, the next speakers have run an uh, extensive research on how asylum adjudication are actually carried out in domestic proceedings. Um, and I think the presumption we often have um, about the gap between law and practice in, in asylum policies seem to be confirmed by their study on the real life asylum adjudication. So the next presentation is delivered by two speakers, uh, Nick Gill, First, who is a professor of uh, human geography at the University of Exeter. He's a political geographer whose work focuses on issues of justice and injustice, especially in the context of border control, mobility, incarceration, and the law. His current research concerns court spaces and access to justice for asylum seekers in Europe. His presentation today is shared with Professor Anthony Good, who is Professor Emeritus in Social Anthropology at the University of Exeter. Um, and Anthony has done extensive field research in Tamil Nadu, South India, and on the use of expert evidence in the British asylum courts. And together with uh, Nick, they have published a book entitled Asylum Determination in Europe and Ethnographic Perspectives. I have read it and is very, very interesting, especially for uh, lawyers who tend to concentrate very much on um, what the law says, but we have uh, sometimes few data on how the law is actually uh, applied in practice. Um, they kindly accepted to present the findings of their book uh, in spite of the difficulties COVID has posed to our academic and private life. So I would like to thank you both um, and I'll give the floor first to Nick and then to Anthony.
Uh, Nick, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Madalena. Thank you, Lila, as well, for your introduction. Really fascinating book. Um, and thanks for persevering with organising all this under such difficult conditions. Uh, I'm sorry I can't be with you in Florence, uh, but it's very nice to be connecting in the way that we are today. Asylum adjudication is not simply legal. Although obviously the law is important, legal doctrine has to be operationalised and implemented. And there are an awful lot of non-legal processes involved. Most research into the law is quite understandably carried out by legal scholars or jurists and is concerned with the law as written or in codified procedures. A sci-fair, which is the project that I lead, takes a different approach, which is ethnographic, geographical and anthropological, and it foregrounds the people, the place, places and the practices of asylum law as much as it does the practices, uh, sorry, as much as it does the policies and the laws. All law takes place in context, and this context is important if we're to understand legal practice in concrete terms. Our focus is on asylum appeals and as in-person asylum appeal hearings in particular. Uh, asylum appeals are the process by which asylum seekers can seek redress if their initial claims are refused. We've conducted research in the UK, France, Italy, Germany, Greece, Austria and Belgium, observing in person around 400 appeals in the UK, around 150 in France and more than 250 in Germany, as well as conducting interviews. Today I'd like to reflect on some of the distinguishing features of the Italian tribunals, because what our data does is it allows us to draw those comparative uh, conclusions between the different countries. Uh, before that, though, I'd like to set out our approach. Uh, in 2016, I was lucky enough to have the opportunity to work with Professor Anthony Good to edit a book that examines what ethnographies of asylum determination involve. And I'll hand over to him to say a little bit more about the book. Thank you. Um, as Nick's just explained, the focus of the book is on ethnographic approaches to the administrative and legal processes involved in asylum determination. And the aim was to provide ethnographic accounts for as wide a range of European countries as possible, uncovering the details of practice that remain invisible to most conventional legal approaches. Now our publishers placed limits on the number of chapters the book could contain, but we did have more offers of chapters than we were able to accept. Even so, there remain some gaps, especially concerning Eastern Europe. But we were especially pleased to be able to include chapters covering, covering Italy and Greece, two key entry points into fortress Europe. The opening section of the book includes an introduction by Nick and me, setting asylum into its socio-political context highlighting the extent of variation in procedure, even among those countries who've signed up to the common European asylum system and explaining the virtues of an ethnographic approach. Now, even though our approach is ethnographic, of course, it's important to understand the legal framework within which asylum decision-making takes place. So the second chapter of the book is a legal overview of the common European asylum system by two academic lawyers. There are then 12 ethnographic chapters divided equally among three broad themes. The key actors involved in the asylum determination process, the means whereby these actors communicate with one another and their daily practices while going about their decision making. From a geographical perspective, there are two chapters on France, two on the UK and one chapter each in order of appearance on Belgium, Greece, Austria, Denmark, Italy by Barbara Sorgoni, Norway, Switzerland and Germany. The authors range from senior academics to um, about to graduate PhD students and in our, in our opinion they all do a great job. Taking the book as a whole therefore the overall approach lends itself to comparison. It highlights the structural differences that still exist among the various national asylum systems but its main originality lies in its exposure of the idiosyncratic ways in which these systems are operated in practice by the fallible individuals who are charged with carrying out these formal processes. 
The chapters are filled with the kinds of detail that only ethnography can provide, but which are often critical to the ways in which administrative and legal systems function. So we learn, for example, about iconoclastic individuals. The archivist in Italy, who allows no one apart from her own staff access to the legal archive she is supposedly curating. The interpreter in Austria, who takes phone calls concerning his car in the middle of interpreting an asylum interview. And the asylum judge in France, who refuses claims based on sexual orientation because the claimant does not look gay enough. More insidiously, because it's more structurally significant, we learn how Norwegian and Swiss decision makers are guided not only by the letter of the law and their formal professional training, but also crucially by the moral economy prevailing in their place of work, whereby decisions are motivated by locally shared tacit knowledge about what a genuine claim should look like, or where it's important not to be seen by one's colleagues as either a softy or a hardliner. Now, we were very fortunate in being able to make the book available on open access so it can be downloaded freely from Amazon or from the publisher's Palgrave. And of course, an advantage of open access is that large numbers of people are liable to download their own copies, though whether, of course, they read them is another matter. Even so, for what it's worth, it was gratifying to see the book heading the anthropology best-selling charts on Amazon for about five weeks in early 2019, and briefly heading the sociology charts as well. So with that, I'll hand over back to my co-best-selling author, Nick, so that he can continue his presentation. Thank you, Tony, no pressure. <laughs> um, sorry about this photo, it's a little bit blurred. Um, um, turning to our Italian findings, uh, we, can, we conducted 62 interviews with Italian lawyers, appellants, cultural mediators and judges in 2019. And I should thank Lorenzo Vianelli, our Italian researcher, for thoroughly conducting these. There are certain things that the Italian system shares with all the other systems that we observed. Pressure to streamline justice, backlogs, attempts to politicize this area of law. One particular issue concerns technology. In France, they've decided to use video linked hearings, which can muffle, reduce or eliminate important aspects of appellant narratives. In Italy, a provision in the Miniti reform to video record the initial interview and use this rather than an in-person meeting to help judges decide the appeal was discussed a lot by our interviewees. Apart from the objection that such an approach might miss development since the interview, such as when the appellant is able to disclose aspects of their story that previously they could not. We heard various reservations about this. Some respondents were concerned that questions would be asked differently by an institution of the state that is not judicial. Others dismissed the, sus the supposed efficiency gains. This is a dumb thing, one judge commented. If it was meant to save time, it acts in the exact opposite direction. We prepare before a hearing and it takes us some 30 to 45 minutes to get it done. If I must hear the debate rather than read the report, it takes me three hours. This is unexplainable. Technology has a big influence on day-to-day -day asylum adjudication and perhaps we can return to this issue of video recording in the questions and answers that follow. Now though, I want to focus on some of the distinguishing features of the Italian system. The first is uh, the degree to which it's decentralized. There were 26 tribunals in Italy with a specialized section on immigration, international protection and free movement of EU citizens at the time of our research. Whereas in France and Belgium, there's only one court. Uh, in Germany and the UK, there are decentralized systems as well. So centralized systems can suffer problems. We heard of asylum seekers sleeping rough outside the French court, for example, because they had to travel from so far away to make it to their morning hearing. The challenge facing decentralized systems, though, is to ensure that all venues hear asylum claims in the same way. Bologna and Florence are on another level, one lawyer told us, meaning that they have judges that are totally different because they are passionate, they study, they do 15 page provisions. While in other branches, maybe you see 30 page provisions because they are copy and paste. Another lawyer reflected that 
In Milan, I know that judges are a little more prepared, meaning that they are having several meetings, monthly, weekly even, than, than they are to send to be specialised, to take special courses at the UNHCR, so that in that case, in my opinion, they are more on it, let's say. Uh, here you see some that really he's just there because he prefers, he's been put there, he prefers to do companies rather than asylum law, end quote. It can be difficult as a researcher to distinguish rumours about different courts from the reality, but there did appear to be substantial differences between courts. In some sections, for example, the appellant was encouraged to go into detail and elaborate upon their experiences, while in others, the hearing was really more, little more than a confirmation of what they'd said in their initial interview. Italian first instance asylum hearings are also usually not public, which is similar to Greece, Denmark and other EU countries. The diagram that you can see there is a typical layout of a UK court and you can see that there's a public gallery, a seating for observers there, which isn't generally the case uh, in the Italian uh, appeals. Some appellants defended this decision. So this is a Senegalese male appellant that we spoke to about the closed nature of the Italian uh, appeals. It can happen that some journalists might come to listen to you and that the next morning when you wake up, you find that your history is on everybody's lips and in the newspaper. So his, he had quite a strong fear of publicness. And indeed in Germany, we sometimes felt that the court's commitment to publicness was insensitive to the appellant. When, for example, whole classes of university students appeared unannounced to listen to a sensitive hearing and were sometimes quite disruptive in the hearing itself. Conversely though, an Italian judge mused that having public hearings could be beneficial if it was done carefully, such as allowing appellants or judges to opt out because of the social control that it may offer guaranteeing against inappropriate judicial behavior. Indeed, appellants were some of the primary beneficiary, beneficiaries of public hearings in France, where they routinely sit in the back of hearings before their own so that they can learn what to expect, develop familiarity with and confidence in the court and prepare themselves mentally. A final feature that we'd like to draw attention, in, attention to in relation to the Italian system concerns the payment of interpreters. Every country struggles with providing adequate interpretation services. That was a common finding of our empirical research. In Italy, though, we were told repeatedly that the state could not pay for interpreters at hearings for some complex technical reasons, and instead that asylum seekers themselves were expected to find and pay for them, unlike in other legal types of Italian appeals. Although it sometimes put appellants at ease to know their interpreter, this introduces serious problems. First, there's the risk of exploitation or the appellant simply not having the right contacts. Second, interpreters are not trained in their tasks. So they often have to be schooled by the judges. This can mean judges waste time and sometimes do not trust the interpreter's confidence, uh, sorry, interpreter's competence. Third, untrained interpreters are more likely to seek to add parts to appellant's narratives. One judge told us that they open quote, empathize too much with the story. They add things and I can sense it, close quote. He gave the example of Ukrainian women who came to translate for their sons and could not resist adding their own opinions in their translations. Uh, we're writing academic papers and a book about our findings at the moment. Our argument is that we need to attend to the practical and idiosyncratic aspects of legal processes in order to fully understand them. We're interested in the operational aspects of asylum appeals, that is how they are made concrete or how the abstract law is implemented in practical terms, which we think is a valuable complementary perspective to the more common legal ones and can open up a series of important debates. We welcome your views on our findings. Thank you very much, Nick and Anthony, for your truly inspiring findings. Um, I think perhaps even also Luca Miniti uh, will have uh, some remarks to do. 
Uh, he's an asylum uh, judge in one of the courts that you mentioned is producing extensive judgments. So uh, I'll be very interested to um, learn what he thinks about your findings in, in Italy. Um, and also, I think you mentioned uh, one of the key uh, challenges that the next speakers are going to discuss, and that is technology, uh, new technologies, and how, what kind of challenges, problems, issues these poses to um, asylum governance. Uh, so our next uh, speakers um, are going to address this particular challenge from both the international and European perspective. Uh, the first speaker is Anna Beduski, um, who will focus in her presentation on the implication of uh, technological advances for states um, under international human rights law. Uh, she argues that big data can and should be used as a tool for the protection of migrants' human rights. Uh, Anna Beduski is an associate professor of law at the University of Exeter. Her research focuses on international human rights law, technology, and international migration and refugee law. Her more recent uh, publication evaluates international migration management in the age of artificial intelligence. Anna, um, thank you for accepting to participate and the floor is yours. Thank you. I'll just share my PowerPoint with everyone. I hope you can see it in big. Yeah, well, thank you, uh, Madeline, and thank you, Lila, for uh, organizing and for the opportunity of talking about that, even though indeed it would have been nicer to be uh, present in Florence, but well. Um, Today, uh, I'm going to move a little bit, as uh, Madalina was saying, the topic uh, of the discussion towards this question of um, uses of technology in the field of international migration, and in particular, how uh, big data can be used in the field of international migration, looking at the opportunities and the challenges for states under international human rights law. So, Big data uh, of international migration is something that uh, we could define just by saying it's large quantities of data uh, in, in a very complex um, architecture that would require computational capability to be analyzed. But just to give you an example, so now we're all online, right? And we're having this presentation online. So this is creating some sort of digital footprint. The same I bet that uh, every uh, person that is now listening to us has perhaps exchanged some messages with another person using technology. Perhaps we have uh, contacted our loved ones or our friends uh, on social media. We have been using our mobile phones that contain uh, GPS technology. And uh, so all of these uh, technologies, they create a number of traces of data that uh, are then stored and used for different purposes. There is no different uh, difference with uh, migrants. And here I'm using the term migrants as a very uh, liberal uh, term encompassing asylum seekers, economic migrants, asylum seekers, and refugees. So as anyone that would have to travel, now we would probably bring our mobile phones and try to use technology. So would perhaps Google uh, the best route. We would try to uh, communicate with our family and friends using uh, social media, for example. And uh, we would all do that. Uh, and all this data would be created. To that, we add other sources of data that uh, are very interesting when we look at uh, migration through the sea, so via uh, Mediterranean, for example, routes, as we have uh, systems of automatic identification and uh, broadcast warning systems, which are, um, for, for example, the first one is a system that uh, is fitted in a boat and that provides real-time information to other boats, but also to coastal authorities. And all of this information is being collected and stored and used for uh, a number of purposes. And uh, we look more and more at the purposes of surveillance, 
but uh, as we will see here, there are other ways that we could use this uh, data as well. So in my research, I had been looking at the uses of big data analysis and uh, as uh, Madalena was pointing out, also through um, artificial intelligence systems. So using artificial intelligence fed by this type of data to analyze this vast amount of data to, uh, for example, predict behavior, predict human behavior, predict the next migration crisis, if we uh, believe that uh, that's the way we want to look at it, and to uh, use that for international, international migration management. So to put tools in place to uh, practices of states, of international organizations, to uh, try to manage international migration. So this is one uh, side of the, the research that I have been done that I've been doing. Uh, the other one is uh, the implications that using technology and big data uh, type of technology, artificial intelligence, what is uh, the implications, what are the implications that these technologies have for the protection of migrants' human rights, and uh, precisely whether states have obligations under international law to use these types of uh, technologies when, when they have the uh, capability to do so. So I'll start with uh, the more negative side, the, the part of risks that is uh, more uh, common in the academic literature, but not just academic literature, but also NGOs have um, put forward a number of reports about that. So there are a number of risks on uh, using these technologies and uh, big data in the field of international migration and specifically for migration management. There are risks associated with privacy and data protection, which can be restricted more in, insofar as migrants uh, are concerned, more than insofar as nationals uh, in the state are concerned. That's the case in the UK, for example, where uh, data protection is much more restricted to foreigners, including EU nationals, than um, to domestic, um, so UK nationals. Another important risk is uh, to use technology for surveillance and surveillance that is done in a way to further criminalize migration. So these associations between migration and criminalization are more and more important. They are very well uh, documented in the academic literature. I think Lila was uh, uh, saying, um, touching on that in the beginning. And uh, here it's the technology. So the, using these sources of data that are quite uh, vast and important nowadays to further criminalize mi migration, to further deny protection to migrants, to further discriminate them, or to uh, implement techniques of um, or practices of refoulement or uh, border securitization. So to give you an example, if we could use uh, and we can, some states authorities already can use um, big data. So these vast amounts of information to uh, predict the next uh, migration, uh, large influxes of people, they can also do that in order to more aptly discriminate people or to more aptly uh, make sure that uh, they would prevent these people to coming into their territories. So influencing their practices in a way that uh, would be not very compliant uh, or not compliant at all with uh, the principle of non refoulement for example. So these are the risks that uh, we have on using technology in a way that is this use of technology for surveillance, for uh, doing that uh, in, in a way that would not be compliant with uh, international law and uh, the protections that we have in place. Now, one thing that I was very interested in was to look at the other side of the coin. So to flip a little bit the coin and see whether the development of these modern technologies, because they affect the capability of states, whether they affect that in, in the capability of the states to identify indiv individuals that would be in need of protection and whether states must have an obligation to use the available technologies to identify 
and assist vulnerable migrants, provided obviously that protection is mandated by human rights instruments that they are part of. So in other words, if they can, must they do that? So if they have the, the technologies and they're using that, let's say for surveillance, must they also use that for uh, protection? So that was uh, the question that I was very interested in trying to answer. And uh, here you would see, uh, I have an argument and uh, the argument that is in, in, in the uh, article that I have published, you have to reference a little bit later on um, whether the obligation to protect one's life, but also the obligation to protect against ill treatment and trafficking. These are the three uh, legal bases that I, I had looked at in particular in this article. Uh, whether that could specifically encompass new technological means, so means that the state authorities would deploy, and uh, in that connection in two uh, main ways, if the states have already successfully used these technologies in a connected field, so for example, if the states are using this technology for uh, surveillance, but also if it is reasonable to believe that these are the only effective means to fulfill the obligation. So the obligation to protect one's life or to protect against ill treatment and trafficking, thus using the technology to prevent, for example, uh, unnecessary deaths. So let me give you an example to illustrate that. Uh, and I'll look at the prevention of migrant deaths at sea. So here we have a clear legal basis. There is a right to life that uh, everyone within the jurisdiction of a state uh, that is party to one of uh, the international treaties relating to human rights law uh, have, so including migrants, uh, asylum seekers, refugees. And uh, we know that states, they don't have only a negative obligation, so an obligation to refrain from unlawfully taking the life of someone. So the negative parts of refraining, not uh, taking the life of someone, but they also have a positive obligation, meaning an obligation to take measures to, for example, prevent unnecessary deaths of those individuals that are within their jurisdiction. That's what comes out of uh, the very settled case law of all, uh, both the European Court of Human Rights but also the Inter-American Court of Human Rights. And uh, we can read more about the um, both sides of positive and negative obligations uh, on the general comment number six of the Human Rights Committee. So if we take that the legal basis is there and states have a, a positive obligation to adopt measures to prevent uh, unnecessary deaths of, of people, that also relates to migrants. So we know that uh, that's something that would apply to migrants, for example, at sea. But obviously these uh, obligations have limits. So there are three uh, sets of limits here. The obligations shouldn't be impossible or imposing an impossible or disproportionate burden on the state. Um, so in the case of preventing, adopting measures to prevent the deaths of people migrating in the sea, uh, which is my example here, it shouldn't be impossible or disproportionate for the states to use technology to do so, which uh, is a hurdle that we could easily clear if we think that states are using this technology more and more, and if we could uh, establish that they are using this technology more and more for uh, reasons, for example, of surveillance. So it would not be an impossible or disproportionate burden to ask states to use technology to, uh, for example, uh, have targeted measures of search and rescue at sea. But then uh, the second condition would be that states, uh, state authorities would have to have knowledge or ought to know that there is a real and immediate risk to the life of an identified individual or groups of individuals. Here again, if we take the context of uh, migrants at risk of dying, let's say, at to give an example, in the Mediterranean Sea, uh, these are uh, in, specifically in the Mediterranean Sea. These are uh, migratory routes that are quite well known, 
and uh, there are a number of international organizations, non-government uh, organizations, and even private uh, own uh, boards that keep uh, having uh, giving information about people in boats that look precarious in uh, this um, in this very well-known uh, Mediterranean migratory routes. And so we could argue that state authorities have the knowledge or ought to know that uh, there is a real risk uh, and that this risk is immediate of leaving people uh, to die at sea in uh, boats that sometimes are very, very precarious and that if not rescued, they would uh, definitely die. And if they are within the jurisdiction of these states, that's an obligation that the state has to prevent uh, unnecessary deaths, a sort of positive due diligence uh, duty to save lives. So that uh, is the second condition here that I believe could be cleared. And then there is a third condition imposed in the jurisprudence of uh, the European and the Inter-American Court, which is that the measures should be within the scope of the powers of the state to avoid that risk. So it shouldn't be something that uh, would not be within their scope. And again, uh, if we think about uh, prevention of migrant deaths at sea by using technology to uh, have targeted intervention, we could think that that is within the scope of state and that they have the power to intervene specifically if they know of a specific group of individuals in, in a situation of real and immediate risk of dying in or losing their lives in, in the sea. So that's where uh, I have this uh, argument that it is possible uh, nowadays if states have already developed these capabilities of using technology for the more negative side of surveillance uh, of migrants, why not uh, use that, but uh, for a positive side to uh, implement uh, measures that would actually prevent, for example, migrants uh, that at sea, which uh, could be uh, very useful and uh, in a targeted way. If you want to know more uh, about uh, my research, these are the two um, articles that I have published recently and that relate to these questions of technology and how they are used in the field of international migration, one on big data and the other one on uh, artificial intelligence. Um, thank you very much for your attention. I'll leave it here. Thank you, Anna, for your insightful presentation. A uh, question for Anna, as well as for the previous uh, speakers, can be written in the chat section on YouTube. Uh, please uh, mention in the beginning to whom your question uh, is addressed. Um, and I'll make sure to read uh, all the questions during the Q&A at the end of the presentations. The next uh, presenter, I think, complements very well your presentation, Anna, um, as she will show how migration control is currently achieved not through asylum instruments, uh, whose reform, as I mentioned in the beginning, uh, is still in stalemate, uh, but through the reform of the EU databases. So, while Anna showed uh, a bit more the international uh, framework on uh, governing new technologies, uh, Maria Victoria will concentrate more on the EU legislation governing databases and use of databases in migration. Uh, in her presentation, Maria Victoria Catanzarini discusses how third country nationals data are used for which ends, by whom, and how this raises the risk of their digital vulnerability. Uh, Maria Vittoria is a research associate at the Center for Judicial Cooperation. Uh, before joining us at the center, she was previously a Jean Monnet and Max Planck Institute fellow. She is also a lawyer and her research focuses on data protection, secrecy, and more recently also on judicial independence. Uh, Maria Vittoria, I would like to thank you for joining us, uh, especially because you're supposed to be on maternity leave. So thank you very much for um, arranging your very busy schedule and make room for this presentation. Uh, the floor is yours. Thank you, Mandalina, for the kind invitation, the kind presentation. 
And uh, today I discuss digital vulnerability um, of third country national in the context of interoperability of EU databases. So let me share. Um, my presentation, I don't know, there is a problem, maybe. Sorry, just a moment. So I don't know how it's not possible to share my presentation, but okay. I think there is an issue here. Anyway, it's not possible for me to share my presentation apparently, but I don't know why. Um, maybe we can have support in this sense. Mm, okay. Okay. Uh, maybe okay. perhaps if so, you uh, open... so I have to open the slides first, okay, and then share. Click on green button. What does? No, nothing actually, because my slides doesn't show up. <laughs> I don't know why. Well, we can hear you well, so um... yes. Let me just do the last. Apparently not. I don't know why. Uh, Sounds like to me. Yes. Uh, let me uh, try just a moment in another sense. Okay. Uh, to Giovanni, I sent uh, my presentation to Giovanni Manetti. So I'm sure that uh, he's able to put them on the screen. Um, okay. Okay, done, maybe. So let me uh, provide some, um, uh, some information on the context of my presentation. Um, first, uh, um, what I'm talking about, today's pressing challenges related to security and border management uh, requires more uh, smarter use uh, of information already available uh, to competent public authorities, both national and European. This has prompted the European uh, Commission to launch a process towards the interoper interoperability uh, European uh, large-scale information systems in the fields of migration, asylum, and security. Uh, as you probably know, in December uh, 2017, the Commission issued two proposals for regulation that established uh, a legal framework for interoperability uh, between EU large scale information systems. And these two proposals became regulation and entered into force in May 2018 um, as Borders and Visa Regulation 817 uh, 2019 and Asylum and Migration. Uh, 818-2019. So these uh, regulations are uh, similar um, in their um, rational and, oh, thank you, Giovanni. Okay, thanks a lot. Uh, these regulations are similar in their approach and um, they differ only because one is on borders and visa and the other one is on asylum and migration. So, um, let me just uh, uh, giving you uh, some research context uh, on what I mean uh, by digital vulnerability. So we put together two um, aspects, interoperability, which is a technical fun functionality of information system that enables to exchange data and sharing information, and vulnerability, which is uh, in the inability of people, organization of societies to withstand adverse impact for multiple stressors to which they are exposed. And today I'm very glad that one of the co-panelists is Anna Beduski, uh, who is a very uh, expert in the field and uh, um, extensively wrote on legal vulnerability. Uh, I can recall um, the, 
her idea on composite nature of uh, vulnerability, both uh, according to the group dimension, so the group dimension of third country nationals, and uh, the contextual dimension, so according to their social marginalization. Uh, so vulnerability uh, could be a potential relational objective uh, um, concept, legal concept, a descriptive one of a status, of a legal status, and prescriptive of legal consequence. Um, interoperability, how interoperability can be connected with the concept of vulnerability. Interoperability may be a useful tool to address legitimate needs uh, of competent authorities using uh, this large scale information system and to contribute to the development of effective and efficient information sharing. Interoperability is not only or primarily a technical choice, this is the point, but rather is a political choice liable to have profound legal and societal consequences that cannot be hidden behind allegedly technical um, changes. Um, what's um, the topic uh, um, on, so the regulation create a new centralized database that would contain information about millions of third country national, uh, including their biometric data. And due to its scale um, and the nature of the data to be stored in these databases, the consequences of any data breach could seriously harm uh, a potentially very large number of individuals, uh, above all third country nationals. Lives of third country nationals may be neglected uh, due to a false perception of their personal data and consequently a lower protection to be afforded to their privacy. So let me, no, sorry, who, who is moving my slides? I don't know who, but... So I have to, to go to the third slide. I, oh, okay. I don't know what's wrong with my, okay. So the third slide. So why uh, this kind of vulnerability is digital and why is tailored to third country national? As the law and technology uh, intertwine in composite ways, uh, interoperability brings to light the real challenges in transposing technical solutions into the legal design. So my presentation argues uh, at the end of the day that the central issue at the stake with interoperability is in fact how data will be used, for which ends, and by whom. Uh, and if this data can be owned or not by data users. The six uh, system uh, that are rendered into interoperable by the, this regulation and I will discuss in a moment are complementary and except uh, with the exception of the Schengen Information System, uh, SIS, exclusively focus on third country national. The system support national authorities in uh, uh, managing border migration and asylum, visa processing and in fighting crime and terrorism. We can go to the fourth slide, sorry. I can't. Okay, thank you. So the tasks of interoperable actors are the, uh, those highlighted in the slides, but the interplay between these tasks, so protecting citizens, fighting crime, securing borders and managing migration, um, the interplay between these uh, tasks and in particular security on the one hand and the lack of transparency in decision making may raise issues of potential discrimination towards third country national as interoperability in fact affects only these individuals. Uh, as you know, uh, under EU law, member states are competent in matters of security under Article 4 of the Treaty on the European Union. So this is a very tricky point in the legal design of interoperability. Let's go ahead, please. Fifth slide. Thank you. So this is uh, an infographic that uh, with the <laughs> kind support of Giovanni Manetti, um, we uh, elaborated uh, in the framework of a project uh, run under the Migration Policy Center and the Law Department of the European University Institutes. And uh, this infographic 
shows how individuals are in transition across interoperable components. components. So let me just introduce uh, which are these databases. So the databases are six and um, mm, are exactly these. So the Schengen Information System, SIS, with a broad spectrum on alerts on persons, refusal of uh, entry or stay, uh, European arrest warrant, uh, warrant uh, missing persons, judicial procedure assistance, discrete and specific checks, and objects, so including lost and stolen invalidated identity or travel documents. The increase um, uh, the ECRIS is uh, um, the European Criminal Record Information System for Third Country National, which would be an electronic system for exchanging information on previous convictions handed down against third country national by criminal courts in the European Union. Uh, the VIS is the Visa Information System with data on short stay visas. The Eurodac uh, system uh, collects fingerprints data of asylum applicants and third country nationals who have processed the external borders of the European Union irregularly and who are illegally staying in a member state. Uh, finally, entry exit system in, has the, as a legal basis. Uh, uh, so the current system of manual stamping of passport and uh, is uh, um, collects uh, electronic uh, um, register of name types of travel documents by bio, um, biometric data and the date and place of entry and uh, uh, ATS is the European Travel Information Authorization System which would once adopted be a largely automated system that would gather and verify information submitted by visa exempt third country national ahead of their travel to the Schengen area. So we can go ahead, please. Um, besides, of, of course, besides uh, these six uh, um, databases, uh, we have also the interoperability of Interpol and Europol uh, databases, but uh, uh, they have their own regulation and a very uh, strict and precise discipline. So the point of this presentation is that uh, um, third country national entering in interoperable uh, systems um, are entitled to a, a sort of transitioning rights because of their transitioning status. So we can face two possible scenarios uh, to open opposite paths for interoperability, depending on how the slippery overlap uh, between the notion of data users and data owners will be integrated into the system. First, the first question is, should individual or state actors or European agencies own personal data? Does this mean that interoperability of information systems becomes nothing more than a data transfer with all the consequences in terms of power of non-disclosure and discretion of data originators? And the answer to this question is that although a property right over data may be abstractly uh, useful for offering strong protection to the data subject of third country national, uh, such cases are unlikely to be um, practices. Uh, and uh, this is only not the European approach to data protection. So third country national are often obliged to hand over their data, even if they are only mine to apply for a visa or any other permits authorization. They have no other choice. This is the sense of their vulnerability. A right over property does not add anything as they have no commercial or legal power vis-a-vis -vis states or agencies. So a model where interoperability would be a data transfer would also assure an advantage for the primacy of the public interest uh, for those authorities that originate data in the information system through single databases at national level. The second alternative could be that uh, uh, nobody is owner of this data. So should personal data be unknownable by states or European agencies or by individual, what happens 
what happens in this case? In this case, interoperability would be considered as a peer-to-peer -peer framework in which third parties can use data for multiple but limited purposes, whereas individuals, and in particular, the third country national, can contrast the fragmentation of their identities uh, through the control of flows of bit and pieces data. We can go ahead, please. Thank you. So you, you can uh, see that uh, in interoper interoperable information system, data are processed upon inclusion. This inclusion, of course, faces different perspectives if we look at the legal regime applicable. So first of all, we have the perspective of law enforcement and border management access to data. We have also the perspective of a third country national, the perspective of interoperability as data transfer and possibly cross-border processing, and ultimately the perspective of algorithmic unaccountability or transparency. It depends upon the solution. So can a potential misuse of technology, uh, technologies undermine third country national rights? So this is one of the questions that is underlying this uh, um, research. And how does the unlawful processing of data enforce, uh, affect enforcement access to interoperable uh, system with uh, multiple purposes? And uh, my personal answer to these are that Interoperability creates a new interaction, of course, with other existing instruments, such as the operational data regime and the relevant uh, data protection framework, and also raises issues related to safeguarding of international protection and fundamental rights protection. And how exactly this uh, legal regime intertwine um, is effectively not clear at present. So firstly, it's not clear how the applicability of GDPR to data processing that, uh, that does not fall under the umbrella of the law enforcement directive has any relevance in practice. So we face cases in which a single search may give rise, for example, to multiple uh, results uh, from all the system um, and uh, uh, this can create uncertainty and lack of transparency. Second, there is an emerging risk of indirect discrimination towards certain groups across society, such as third country national, depending upon their treatment as bare data and not individuals. So according to the fragmentation of their identity. We can go ahead, please. So the idea is uh, that uh, interoperability questions uh, the feasibility of several legal regimes. And uh, according to uh, European Data Protection Supervisor guidelines, um, the protection of fundamental rights, including the right to privacy and the right to data protection as enshrined in the EU Charter of Fundamental Rights, is not limited to European national. European Union and member states are bound by it uh, when applying European law uh, to individuals, whether or not they are European citizens. So third country uh, national migrants and uh, asylum seekers uh, are, of course, or should be protected under the European Charter. And the Charter must be the compass for all European policies and law. So these are the model of property under which uh, interoperability uh, can process data. So there is the model of no exclusive rights over data, a uh, pure model. There is another model of exclusive control over data and non-consensual um, uh, regime, which is the model um, and the approach adopted by the European Union, basically. Um, then we have we can have also another model, non-exclusive control and consensual um, uh, regime. And lastly, but not least, uh, there is this uh, uh, tricky issue that we are uh, trying to explore on data ownership. So we can go ahead and rapidly uh, go to the conclusion. So my, um, my argument is that interoperable borders uh, can be a good option for a sort of interoperable justice. 
only as far as interoperability is considered a peer-to-peer -peer framework. And what does it mean? That interoperability could become an instrument to deny the exclusive use of information by originators authorities, so the uh, national authorities who input the data in the system, and at the same time takes the principle of mutual trust seriously. Uh, we can go ahead, please. Uh, but without caveats and limitation, interoperability may become this sort of uh, joke, which is a piper tiger, because the practice of interoperability is really very important. And also having feedbacks of public servants and practitioners in the practice, in the practice of interoperability, which is a new tool, um, formally new tool, but uh, is an informal legal tool that the European Union uh, uses uh, since a long time, is uh, very, very important. So I thank you for your attention and sorry for my um, uh, misunderstanding of uh, technical solution in uh, uploading my presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mavi, for your rich presentation. Uh, I would like to mention that uh, you can find a more extensive version of her presentation published as a blog post uh, on the Migration Policy Center webpage. Uh, and also, I encourage you to address questions to Maria Vittoria in the chat section on YouTube. Our final presentation brings us um, now to the world of asylum courts um, and does dealing with challenges in asylum governance from the perspective of a judge. So the previous presentations mentioned several um, policy and executive challenges. Uh, but um, asylum courts face additional ones. Uh, so they have to deliver fair and just decision under strict time constraints and sometimes limited human resources as uh, Nick has already mentioned in his presentation. But also what uh, often happens is also a sort of intercourt uh, competition. And um, again, as Nick was already anticipating in his presentation, um, there are jurisdictions where asylum courts adopt different interpretation of the same legal rule. Um, and then um, an arbitrator somehow has to make sense of the various divergent judicial interpretation. So um, one of these very heated jurisprudential debate which has taken place um, before the Italian Court of Cassation is actually the topic of our um, last speaker. Um, I have the immense pleasure of introducing uh, Judge Luca Miniti, who is a judge at the Tribunal of Florence. He is specialized on asylum. He is also a trainer for EASO and has delivered several path-breaking judgments in asylum, proposing new interpretation of uh, Italian asylum law uh, based on what I would say a constructive interpretation of uh, EU law and EU charter. Uh, Luca, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, all of you. Can you hear me? Yes, perfectly. Okay. I will share. Is it okay? Yes. Perfect. Thank you, all you. Thank you to European Institute. I'm a pleasure. Uh, to have a little small speech with you about uh, the things that I heard, because a lot of suggestion, a lot of suggestion I heard, I listened in your speeches. Mostly, of course, in speeches in the report of Jill and Good Professor. I would like to discuss with them a lot of time, of course. Uh, my uh, short speech has this focus, credibility assessment and duty of cooperation before Italian Supreme Court. That's uh, an important item, an important matter that we have uh, in front of in Italy. 
the core of the dialogue within Italian jurisdiction is in asylum law, the evidentiary assessment, and in it, credibility evaluation of the applicant's narrative. Italian Supreme Court and first instant judges too argue about the legal nature and the consequences of the credibility assessment. A rough engagement is ongoing. And this confirms my opinion that credibility assessment is the cornerstone of the system. Apparently, the position concerns the judge's duty of cooperating and its link with credibility negative evaluation. But this conflict hides another radical disagreement in jurisdiction about the nature and credibility of the credibility assessment. We meet mostly two different uh, opinions. First approach established that credibility negative evaluation always, I say always, exclude anyway, duty of looking for country of origin information, although regarding the conditions for subsidiary protection, X Article 15, letter C to D, and the conditions of Italian humanitarian protection too, even if both were not influenced by not believable applicant statement. According to this approach, for instance, a not believable story concerning uh, an homosexual persecution should obstacle duty of cooperating regarding condition, different condition of Article 15, letter C, QD, and its, its recognition. This is a minority uh, opinion in the Supreme Court, uh, Italian Supreme Court, and among the first Eastern judges, but it is. Second approach. Assign, on the other hand, this second approach is uh, predominant prevalent, assigns to negative credibility assessment a value only in connection with conditions in individualized. As a refugee status and subsidiary protection, ex article 15, letter A and B. QD. According to this leaning, the claim based on subsidiary protection, ex article uh, 15, letter C, can, can be proved with the help of the judge, has to be proved with the help of the judge. And his duty, the duty of cooperation, the judge always works without individual story hasn't been deemed credible, except of course, in the, if the deception concerns country or area of origin. But on close examination, we find hidden behind this disagreement, further main uh, difference that concerns uh, the legal nature and the legal basis of the credibility assessment. And finally, we can say that this agreement concerns the fact if uh, applicant statement is one of the other evidences, and if credibility assessment is an evaluation tool, a device we use to check the demonstration of the single events as conditions of the different protection, or on the contrary, if credibility assessment is something else, like, like a condition of protection, like a general prerequisite of asylum, preconditions of asylum. On this ground, on this ground, land the last judgment, uh, Cassazione, Supreme, Supreme Court, Cassazione number 8819, this year, uh, a few weeks ago. This decision states that the judge's duty of cooperation is a prior step, come before of the credibility, credibility evaluation, whom 
is an essential device. Therefore, according to this ruling, judges' duty of cooperating with the applicant can't ever be obstructed uh, by negative uh, credibility assessment alone. This is a completely different, uh, you understand, approach, not a midline between the two earlier. It's the approach that I have presented in the paper I will point the, you out at hand. Legal uh, basis of this approach are mostly, not only, mostly letter C of the article uh, for uh, QD recast, 4.5, of course, where it lays down that the applicant statements are found to be current and plausible and do not run counter to available specific and general information relevant to the applicant's case. And thus, first of all, in relation with the credibility assessment, the judge needs to cooperate with the applicant to check currents and plausibility. Letter E of the article 4.5 that lays down that general credibility of the applicant has been established. General credibility of the applicant has been established. General credibility in the meaning of in broad terms, generally, not in the sense of absolute, total, complete. That's another very important element for the decision. According to this judgment, the last one, the, the third way I told, applicant statement is one of the possible evidences, only one of the possible evidences. And credibility is not a precondition of the claim, not a prerequisite for the recognition of the protection, but only an important tool uh, device. Uh, of the evidentiary assessment. Supreme Court specifically explained that credibility assessment can be turned it into, turned into a judgment about applicant fairness. And as a consequence, the credibility negative assessment don't allow to refuse every protection for this reason alone. We could draw two important inferences uh, on it. Applicant statements should be collected at the hearing whenever, whenever the judge has any doubts about the relevant facts alleged. alleged. Judge's duty of cooperation always, always uh, undertakes for the judge to liaise to cooperate with the applicant researching country of origin information. To verify the actuality of the risk, with the exception of the case in which judges' cooperation should be, however, however irrelevant. For instance, when other evidences prove the claim, or when procedural items make judge refuse the claim. At last, important point of the decision is that the ruling highlights that credibility assessment can be can be challenged before the supreme court we know that not only in italy issues of fact tend to be subjected to, to limited scrutiny under uh, the various review mechanisms and that thus may place uh, the credibility assessment in a precarious position in the trial as regards the availability of effective uh, judicial review. But last decision I mentioned clearly states that the breach of the five rules conditions laid down in the article 4.5, QD recast involve, involve, always involve an infringement of the law challengeable before the Supreme Court. The dialogue is not finished, of course. Uh, I want to um, propose you uh, the last consideration about the issue. Make a, probably we may ask ourselves, where does the difficult of the judges to accept this notion and the correct use of the credi credibility assessment come from? Where does it come from? A problem arises certainly uh, 
we we understand we listen uh, good and cheer due to the difficulty to comprehend very different backgrounds the anthropological the ethnographic issue is very very serious very very serious and it bring with that, with, with with it uh, a problem of training a serious problem of uh, training of the uh, judges but probably the difficulties uh, there is a one more difficulty of for the italian judges that arise in their legal tradition we are not used we ju italian judges we are not used we are not accustomed to employ what well, to employ such a low standard of proof Recogni recognizing for the first time in italian law probative force to the applicant statement to the statement of a part of the trial no uh, this difficulty is a, a cultural difficulty is a, a, a difficulty that needs a big 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 uh, uh, training this is the task at last this is the task the challenge that i hope we will overcome uh, but it's not a, a, a short way i i suppose uh, more details uh, we you we find in this um, article that i wrote it's a report in the a conference of the scuola della magistratura in in pisa and you will find the judgment uh, in at this link I show you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Luca, for your presentation. Um, I have to say that I wasn't very much surprised to hear about uh, the developments regarding the extensive duties that um, Italian asylum judges have in regards to credibility of assessment. And this is mostly due to the fact of what you were mentioning before, the uh, legal tradition. Um, and I think maybe Nick will have more to say about that. But from my knowledge, I think perhaps from the various jurisdiction in the EU, the Italian asylum judge has the widest power in terms of uh, judicial review, in terms of uh, questioning and hearing as well. Um, which, unfortunately, I would say other uh, jurisdictions who are more um, falling within the administrative model, um, and I have some examples in mind, for instance, Netherlands, uh, Romania, and most of the Central and Eastern European countries do not have or do not recognize so um, extensive uh, judicial review powers to asylum judges. Um, and this, of course, means that uh, raises the question of actually who has the responsibility to ensure the fundamental rights of asylum seekers in asylum adjudication. Um, and perhaps, who knows, uh, definitely there are discussion at the European level uh, in the framework of the reform of the common European asylum systems to harmonize even more uh, the asylum um, uh, regulations and the asylum procedural rules, uh, but it's there. Its fate is still uncertain, so we'll we'll have to see. Um, but we have already uh, several questions, and I don't want to leave anyone um, outside. So I'll do my best to read all the questions that we received in the chat section. Um, so the first question is from uh, Rul Pinto. Uh, he doesn't say to whom the question is addressed, but I have a feeling that is for Maria, Vittoria and Anna, because it relates to technology. Uh, so his question is, what are the uh, international law justification or not of immigration data using or not regarding to social justice in the context of COVID, where technology and pandemic prevention are related? Uh, and also the next question is, uh, I'll read it because it's um, addressed to Maria Victoria and might be connected, uh, from Veronica Corcodel. Uh, she asked um, whether it would be possible to develop a bit more the peer-to-peer -peer framework idea. 
Uh, in what ways would this change the interoperability borders and how would it make the system more just? Uh, the next question from Cristina Dallara is addressed to Laila. Uh, do you know if there, if there are specific studies or research focused on main problems, gaps and actors involved within the Common European Asylum System implementation stage? I mean, policy focused studies comparing um, Common European Asylum System implementation structure and or main gaps. Um, the next question is from Nish London um, and is addressed to Luca. Um, he says, so as a judge, would you suggest a similar investigative approach as in Germany, where judges are required to hear the whole case from scratch with the appellant present? Um, so, Maybe we can go in the order of the question. I think the first one was um, for Anna and Maria Vittoria. Anna, do you want to um, speak first? Sure. sure, yeah. Well, thank you. That, that's a very interesting question. And uh, if I understand correctly, uh, the relationship between uses of technology and data in the context of COVID and uh, specifically, but not just in relation to migration. So I, I think that's uh, something that we're seeing at the moment is the increasing uh, uses of technology and uh, of all sorts of data of, from big data to, to all uh, sorts of uh, other types of uh, collection of data in order to better fight uh, COVID and to uh, find ways of, uh, for example, contact tracing uh, people using contact tracing applications to find people that could have been infected. Now, if you think about the legal basis on, from the side of uh, privacy and data protection, especially on privacy, we would uh, fall within the, the scope of Article 8 of the European Convention on Human Rights. And here uh, we know that protecting the public health interests and protecting the rights and freedoms of others can be used to reduce or to limit the scope of uh, these rights or the scope of privacy. But on the other hand, we know that despite that being a qualified right, any measures adopted by states would have to clear three different hurdles or tests. So the test of the legality, meaning that the measures would have to have a legal basis and that that legal basis in domestic law, for example, should uh, be um, sufficiently clear. And uh, it would also have to clear the hurdle of necessity so that there should be a pressing social need to do so. And uh, mainly also the test of proportionality, meaning that uh, was there another measure that would have been as effective but uh, less intrusive of uh, one's uh, privacy? So that would also relate to uh, migrants and, and domestic uh, nationals alike. Uh, thank you, Anna. Please, I'd like to ask the speakers to limit to one minute maximum their answers because we're lacking out of time and I don't want to miss any of the other answers. Thank you. Mm, may I? Yes, please, Mavi. Okay. Thank you. So uh, thank you very much for um, the questions. So as we get the first one, I can say that the issue can be examined transversely and the main uh, legal and regulatory challenges for surveillance uh, can be examined in the perspective of citizens, data subjects and public health. First, in the perspective of citizens, the feature is achieving the social need of identifying hotspots without identifying individuals. As for data subjects, uh, app tracing should ensure data anonymity, for example, app tracing, which is uh, at stake uh, in these days, and differentiated content consent to limited time for data storage and besides the exclusion of the use of any form of uh, geolocation of uh, 
uh, data and individuals uh, uh, themselves. And finally, in the perspective of public health, the most important challenge is not is to ease the pressure of uh, on overworked medical system with a procedural and repeated system on notification, disclosure, registration, isolation, treatment, which is compliant with the human rights framework. So it's, it's a complex matter, of course. Uh, regarding the second question on the idea of peer-to-peer -peer framework, uh, yes, of course, is a provoking uh, um, notion, this peer-to-peer -peer framework, as referred to uh, interoperability, but uh, um, I mean uh, by this term, uh, the unknown ability of data. And uh, this consists in a framework, in, a, in, a, in imagining a legal framework in which data originators uh, do not have property ownership over data, as well as individuals that who can control their self uh, information, uh, information on self determination, but not adding necessarily a property on uh, their data. And this peer to peer framework we ensure um, a kind of uh, a smooth compliance to legal uh, framework in the broader sense, uh, because of course um, it does not create any property right, with, which is of course an exclusive right on data, which is not the purpose of interoperability in the sense. I hope it is clear. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mavi. Uh, Lila and then uh, Luca, please try to keep it very short. Yes, uh, my short answer is yes, absolutely yes. Uh, the judge has to uh, hear uh, the whole case from scratch in Italy is uh, the rule, as in German. Uh, this last uh, judgment I mentioned uh, affirm uh, clearly that uh, first instance in Italy is the judge. The administrative procedure is another thing. The first instance uh, in the asylum trial is in front of the judge. So he has to uh, hear all the story again. Thank, Thank you. you, Luca. Uh, Laila? Yes. Um, yeah, so thanks for the question. Uh, just very briefly, uh, I would recommend on this also the project CESAVAL. I can share the screen for a minute because I just opened it in on the internet. So here, I think they have lots of interesting reports which are also synthesizing uh, the literature and also focusing on implementation. And then of course also, which is a standard work but which you might already know, um, is the work by Natasha Zaun also, um, which looks also at the evolution of the common European uh, asylum system, but which really goes into depth also why this implementation problem secure. And I just want to say very last, because I also would really like to hear still from Nick and Anthony, like my personal interest also what you saw as the most striking difference among uh, European Union member states when it comes to approaching how to determine asylum also to have, yeah. And thanks so much to everyone again from my side and also to the audience. Thank you, Lila, very much. I will add a very short clarification to the question of Lila for Nick and, um, and Anthony, um, because it also connects to what Luca was mentioning, whether you found uh, differences between jurisdiction as regards the deference that judges have towards the administration. Um, so I would really love to hear very shortly for you from you on, on these topics. Thanks very much. Yeah. Uh, okay. So uh, just briefly in relation to this question of training that, that Luca brought up in the first time he spoke, I think that's a really important uh, question. Um, what we've seen across Europe is that some judges are, are quite hard to, to teach and to train depending on their career stage. So that's one of the challenges. Um, a lot of judges moved from different areas of law into asylum law, especially around 2015, 2016. So there's another challenge around training there. The level of training at the, that, that's, and how centralised it is, is relatively underdeveloped in comparison to some other areas. Um, although Yazo, I think, is doing some, some interesting and important work there. 
Um, so what, what are the solutions? Well, one thing that one of my PhD students, Laura Shiner, is looking at is online training. Uh, because judges are always too busy to do training but one of the things that they can do is online and I think that also addresses another issue which is uh, just learning more about what other judges are doing both within uh, your own country and uh, and internationally and that's something that again is more feasible in this online world that's emerging so perhaps a vision for the future could be more judicial online mixing so that we can develop a more coherent uh, approach amongst us all and then in terms of the biggest differences um, in Europe it's really it's a really difficult question I mean one of the things that was always the same was the speed um, the speed at which these things are being done the the pressure that justice is under in this particular jurisdiction um, but you're right that some uh, some countries do listen to the whole thing again in the in the hearing, whereas others, um, it's really just a confirmation or a clarification, um, and that can mean that the hearings are just a few minutes long. Um, it depends very much on the uh, representative, of course, um, but uh, it can mean that uh, they're very curtailed because the judge is doing something very different. So in Belgium, for example, that you're not supposed to really introduce anything uh, that's. Uh, except for something that's not in the written, in the written uh, submission from the appellant. So it has to be completely new what you introduce in the hearing. So that makes it a very different hearing to, to somewhere in Germany where you're recapping the whole thing. So yeah, these sorts of differences we found fascinating during our study. Um, can I just say something very briefly? I could say a whole book in answer to, to, to these issues, but ju just on this question of consistency of decision-making. The, the contrast for me is between Taylor House in London, where I did a lot of my research, where there are 26 courts and the judges have lunch together. And I had lunch with them because in those days they were much more open in allowing researchers in. And over lunch, the judges discuss the cases they're hearing. They arrive at a common view. What do we think about this issue nowadays? And they, they discuss it. Contrast that with another court in London, which at the time was hearing all the Kosovan Albanian cases because Kosovo and Albanian interpreters were in short supply. So one judge did Monday to Wednesday, the other judge did Thursday to Friday. They never saw each other. And only after several weeks did they discover through the court staff that they were analyzing and assessing the credibility in a completely different way. And they were both of them so shocked by discovering this difference that they actually went public and discussed it at conferences and what the implications of this were for the fairness of judicial decision making. So I'll just deliver that one anecdote. There's lots more I could say, but I know time is short. Thank you very much, uh, both Nick and Anthony. Um, surely if um, the followers want to learn more, your book is on open access so they can read it. Um, I think we came to a conclusion uh, of our webinar. Um, and I would like to thank you very much uh, to all the speakers uh, for being available and for your very interesting uh, presentations. Um, I think um, all your presentation uh, will remain available uh, online, so people uh, also have access to your email and they can contact you directly. Um, I would also like to thank a lot Giovanni, Angelica and Ciara because without their help, uh, which has been wonderful, this webinar would not be uh, possible. Um, and um, I would like to invite you uh, to the next webinar of the Migration Policy Center, which I understand from Lila that is going to take place on 1st of July. And it's going to tackle the subject of uh, gender and migration. So uh, stay tuned on the website of the Migration Policy Center and also on the website of the Center for Judicial Cooperation. Once again, thank you all also for your question. Very interesting. Um, and see you next time. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.